This is Living Waters of Grace, the teaching ministry of Lewis Harrell, assistant pastor of Calvary Chapel of Westmoreland County in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. Now here's Pastor Lewis as he continues teaching through God's Word. We need to be reminded so that we don't forget these things. And this is what Peter was concerned about. He was concerned that if we don't remind you, you might forget these things. And when you forget these things, then you become vulnerable to bad teaching. So I want to remind you of these things. And that's why we have so many Bible studies here. We have all studies reminding each other of the Word of God. Because that's what's really important. God's Word is what's important. It's accurate, and some of it is an eyewitness account of the life of Jesus, as you'll get to hear in today's message with Pastor Lewis. The Word of God is alive and active and can change your heart and anyone else's as you spend more time in it, growing in your relationship with God. As you grow, you're also called to tell others about the same hope for eternity that you have so they can experience it too. But it all starts with spending time alone with God in His Word. Now here's Pastor Lewis in 2 Peter chapter 1 with today's edition of Living Waters of Grace. As we pick it up in the first chapter of 2 Peter, we pick it up in verse 12. I'm going to first read from 12 to 15, and then we're going to go back and make comment. And it just simply says this. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. So we have Peter here who is speaking once again to a dispersed church. People are dispersed everywhere because of heavy persecution. They have been run out of their homelands and they're seeking refuge, asylum and other places where they can practice their faith without persecution, without oppression. And Peter is writing to them because he is encouraging them, even during this time of heavy persecution, which he himself is also dealing with and also in the midst of. So he starts off here where he says, for this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things. So what things is Peter talking about? What things is it that he's reminding these believers of? And in order to see that, we have to go back. And we go back to 2 Peter chapter 1, and we look at verse 5. And verse 5 through 9 gives us a snapshot of what it was that he's talking about that he wants to remind them of. First of all, he wants to remind them that when they were converted, and this goes back even to verse 2, before verse 5 started, he reminds them that when they were converted, that they were converted by the divine power of God who gave them all things that pertain to life and godliness. He also reminded them that through the divine nature, which they also received during their conversion, that they have escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, and that they have exceeding and great and precious promises through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And then he gets to verse 5 over there, and he says, so therefore, for that very reason, giving all diligence, giving all effort, giving all work, I want you to add to your faith. And he mentioned seven things that they should add to their faith. First is virtue. He said add knowledge. And to knowledge, add self-control. And to self-control, he wanted them to add perseverance and godliness and brotherly kindness. And to their brotherly kindness, he asked that they add love. So as they go through all these things, and Peter's reminding them, so because he's reminding them, we must know that he's obviously, or at some point or another, they knew this information. 
They knew this. So he was reminding them of these things. Now, I want to mention that once we go back here to verse 12 now, I want to mention that as we go through this, you'll see that he uses the word remind, reminder, and reminding. He uses those things three times in this scripture. In verse 12, he says, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things. And then in verse 13, he says, as long as I'm in this tent, I want to stir you up. How? By reminding you. And then in verse 15, he says, moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. So it's important for Peter that they be reminded of the word of God. And that's why we meet Calvary Chapel so that we can remind each other of the truth, of the word of God, the things that encourage us, the things that cause us to grow, the things that cause us to be mature Christians. We have to remind each other of those things. So that's why we hear, even when you listen to what Peter has to say, and then you compare that against what Paul has to say, you see parallels. Because the apostles are always reminding us of the same things. And there's nothing wrong with being reminded of the same things because we need to be reminded so that we don't forget these things. And this is what Peter was concerned about. He was concerned that if we don't remind you, you might forget these things. And when you forget these things, then you become vulnerable to bad teaching. So I want to remind you. Of these things and that's why we have so many Bible studies here we have all studies reminding each other of the Word of God because that's what's really important so Peter said as long as I'm living as long as I'm still living I'm going to remind you of the Word of God now he saw this as his responsibility if you look back in Luke chapter 22 verse 32 is when Jesus actually charged Peter When he said, look, Satan wants to sift you as wheat, Peter. Satan wants to hurt you. Satan wants to accuse you. Satan wants to have an impact on you. But when you are converted, strengthen your brothers. And Peter is writing these things because he wants to strengthen his brothers. He is following the commandment that the Lord gave him. He's following that commandment and he's following it until his death. And that's why he says, as long as I am in this tent, This present tent, this present tent means this present dwelling. Now, this tent means it's a temporary thing. All tents are are temporary. Nobody lives in a tent, right? You know, we go, we use tents when we go camping, and we use it for a weekend. Or we use it sometimes if we want to just get away and go in our backyards, and we put up a tent, you know. I just, (laughs) you know, hopefully you're not forced to go in the backyard and put up a tent. But these tents are temporary dwellings, right? They're not permanent dwellings. When the children of Israel was coming out of Egypt, they were tabernacling. You know, they were going from place to place. They were living in temporary dwellings. They weren't permanent. We will have a permanent dwelling when we go to be with the Lord. We will have our permanent dwelling. But until then, we live in this temporary dwelling. And it is temporary. I mean, these bodies that we live in, these tents... They are temporary, and just like an old tent, after a while, what happens to an old tent? Starts to smell, starts to sag, put it up, might not be as strong as it was when you first put it up, when you first got it. These tents break down because they're temporary, because they are temporary. So Peter said, but as long as I'm in this temporary dwelling, I want to remind you. And he says, because I know that pretty soon I'm going to be going home to be with the Lord. He said, Jesus already showed me that. And Jesus did show him that when Jesus told him that, look, there's going to be a day when you're going to go where you're going to be led. Someone's going to take you where you don't want to go. You're going to come home to be with me. You're going to be crucified just like I am. And the word has it that Peter was crucified, but he was crucified upside down because he did not feel that he was able or that he was worthy to be crucified upside right like his master was and he was executed in fact him and Paul were about around the same time they met their execution they left this world but then he says moreover I want to be careful I want to make sure I want to be diligent to ensure that you always have a reminder even after my departure so that's why we have the record of first and second Peter because of his reminding and leaving a reminder, the word of God. You see, we're not going to always be here. 
But the word of God, the Bible says the word of God, it endures forever. It endures forever. So Peter left something that they will always have. And I want to point out something that we're going to end up getting back to. But in that last line where it says, moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. That word decease actually means exodus, after my departure, after my exodus. And we'll get back to that in a minute because it's kind of important, that word exodus. But then he goes to verse 16. And in verse 16, he says, for we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty, for he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. There's a lot in this. And I'm going to take my time because this is where a good bulk of our time we're going to spend. First of all, please turn back with me very briefly back to Matthew chapter 16. And here in Matthew chapter 16, we're going to start here in verse 13. But this is where the beginning of Peter's experience, this is Peter's experience is what he's sharing with us. And he's giving us a broad look of how he came to a confirmation that Jesus Christ is truly who he said he was, that he is the Messiah, the son of the living God. But this was first revealed to Peter back here in chapter 16 of Matthew in verse, starting at verse 13. And I'm just going to read it through to 16. He says, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? I can imagine they're being together. They've just taken this journey and they sat down probably to fellowship or to eat something, you know, after coming from their journey, coming into into the region of Caesarea Philippi, and he gets them all together, and he decides to ask a very important question to those who are following him. He says, who do men say that I am? I know you're out there in the marketplaces. I know you hear the water cooler talk or the pond talk or the donkey talk, whatever it is that they put together. I know you hear what's going on. So who would they say that I am? Who are you? What are you hearing? Their responses were very interesting. Some said you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. And others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. That's who men say that prophets. That's who men say that Jesus was. That's what others say that don't know him. And I can imagine him looking right in their eyes at this point, raising up a little bit. And then comes to verse 15. And he says, but who do you say that I am? You who are with me, you who pray with me, you who fellowship with me, you who sleep in the same area that I sleep in, you who break bread with me, you who have seen some of the miracles that I've done, you who have heard my teaching, who do you say that I am? And it was only Peter, the only one who said, look at verse 16, only Simon Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And and, and I noticed Jesus's response here. (laughs) I find this interesting. Jesus's response was not, well done, Peter. What's wrong with the rest of y'all? How come the rest of y'all didn't know that? That wasn't his response. His response was this. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Jesus recognized that even though they were all with him, even though they were all under his teaching and all under and saw all of his miracles, Jesus realized that Peter was the one that the Father revealed who Jesus Christ is. Peter is. How many of you ever thought, out of all the people that I know, all the people that I hang out with, that I used to hang out with, all the people that I, all the people in my family, 
people who are much more intelligent, much brighter, much better than I am, how come I'm the one that recognize who Jesus Christ is? How come I'm the one that Jesus, that, that God revealed his son to? And that's exactly what Peter, Peter is in this place. Look, Peter was, a, he was you know, cussing Peter, ear cutting Peter. Peter got naked, jumping into the water. He said, depart from me. I'm a sinful man by his own, by his own witness. He said he was a sinful man. He was oppositional. He was stubborn, denying, but yet he was the one that God revealed that day. God revealed who his son, Jesus Christ, was. And we all have that experience. God revealed his son to you. Regardless of who it was that you grew up with, regardless of who you've been around, God revealed it to you. Two people can come and sit in a sermon and hear the word of God, and only one will God reveal sometimes. Only one of them will be revealed the truth that God is speaking through that word that changes the life of somebody who comes in. Maybe today, God will speak and reveal his son to somebody in here today. I pray he does. I pray he does. So that day, he revealed himself to Peter. But let's go on because now we get back. Now we get back to 2 Peter, verse 16. And Peter now begins to address some of this because he says, okay, that stuck in the back of his mind what was revealed to him that day. I'm sure that was in the back of his mind. So now he's writing to these dispersed believers. And it must have been a situation where they were beginning to question whether the word of God was authentic or whether these fables, I'm sure people were feeding them those things. Why do you listen to that mess? Oh, those are just made up stories. Those are just myths. Those are just fables. Those are wise tales. Why do you listen to that? You're too intelligent. I used to, I used to hear people tell me when I would talk to them about, about the Lord, they would say, do you really believe that? You're too intelligent to believe something like that. And that told me right there, they didn't really know me. No one ever accused me of being too intelligent to do anything. <laughs> I'm just being real. <laughs> But people want to see these as fables. These are, these are wise tales. And still today, people question the word of God. They question whether it's legit. They question its authenticity. They question the source. Still today, people want to say that these are cunningly devised fables. These are wise tales. These are just made up stories. And the reason why they feel that way is because a lot of the pagans... At that particular time, they had idols. They weren't worshiping the true God. They had idols. So they would make up stories about these idols to try to give them power, to try to apply to them some kind of a force or some kind of a majesty. They had to make up these stories because they were idols. They weren't true gods. So so even some of the believers at some point that were becoming false teachers, they would start making up these false stories and these myths about the word of God, saying that it's not all true. It's, you know, these are just made up. Man made these things up in the, in the figment of their imaginations. And Peter's saying to you, for we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So Peter is saying, wait a minute, this isn't something we heard. This isn't something that we just, you know, jumped on some kind of a story. This is not a bedtime story that we just repeated that we heard from somebody else. This is not some sort of a a, a tale that we put together. No, we were eyewitnesses. We saw that this is the Messiah. We saw this. So now he's referring back to, he's referring back to the, the mountain of transfiguration. Now it's recorded in Matthew It's recorded in Mark and it's recorded in Luke. But what I want to do, because to make this really clear, I want to go back, first of all, to Matthew. Because as we read all all the way through, when you got down to verse uh, 17, you see where it says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Okay, so let's go back to Matthew chapter 17. I'm going to start there first. 
In Matthew chapter 17, starting in verse 1, he says there, now six days after, now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And this is what this transfiguration looked like. It says his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with them. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it's good that we should be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Now, please, very quickly, turn to Luke chapter 9. Look at verse 28. He says, and it came to pass after eight days. Whoa, wait a minute. Matthew said it was only after six days. And if you were to go to look at Mark chapter 9, Mark said it was only six days. But Luke said it was after eight days. What was after eight days after Jesus had mentioned to all of his disciples that surely there are some of you who are standing here who will not taste death until you see the son of man coming in the kingdom of God. So he said, well, OK, so wait a minute. Matthew said it was six days afterwards. Mark said it was six days afterwards. But Luke said it was eight days afterwards. Now, I just, the reason why I bring that up is because, see, some people will try at that point to try to make it sound like it's a discrepancy, to try to make a big deal out of this issue. But they all say that he was transfigured. All of them say he was transfigured. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record that Jesus was transfigured. Now, I don't know about you, but if I have somebody I love that was in a burning building, and someone told me that he was saved out of that burning building by someone who just happened to pass by. I don't care if three people tell me, well, one person tells me, well, you know, well, he saved him out of that burning building on his way out of town. Well, no, no, no. A second one come and say, well, no, he, he saved him out of this burning building while he was on his way into town. I don't care when <laughs> he saved him. I don't care if they saved him on the way into town or saved him on the way out. I just care about the fact that he saved them. That's all I want to hear. And this is what we need to understand about the truth of the scriptures. Look, that's what makes the scriptures so authentic. There may be things like that when you can ask people about a story, and we can ask people and hear about a story, something that happened 10 minutes ago that everybody witnessed. You're going to get different accounts of what happened. But the main thing will remain the same. The main thing will remain the same. You may hear Lewis pounding on the couch, right? You may hear that. Some, everybody may say to you, boy, Lewis was in there pounding on that desk. Somebody's going to say, well, he pounded on the desk when he first got up to speak. Somebody, somebody say he pounded on the desk right before he got ready to leave. Somebody might say, well, he pounded on the desk when he was talking. It doesn't matter. The fact is, is that everybody saw that Lewis pounded on the desk. Let's not get into quarrels and discrepancies and battles over small things that are not really significant. Jesus was transformed on that mountain. Everybody saw his glory on that mountain. On that mountain, Peter, and not only Peter, we're going to get into that in a second, not only Peter, they saw their teacher, their master, their Lord. They saw his glory of what he was in heaven on that mountain. In a world and a nation that's perpetually divided, a year like this one is no stranger to division within the church as well. In today's message, Pastor Lewis touched on themes in First and Second Peter where the author knew that there was a tendency to divide about things that were not as important as the gospel message. He urged new believers to stay grounded and rooted in the word and to what was true and knowledgeable. This takes a level of spiritual maturity that you have to be all in in order to do. Maybe something you heard today has sparked something within you, convicting you, inspiring you, just even a friendly reminder of what God's called you to. Don't lose sight of the most important thing in following Jesus. 
being an example of Christ and encouraging others to enter into that. If you're unsure what some of this even means, we'd like to refer you to our website, calvarychapelonline.com. There you'll find an About tab that will walk you through what we as a church believe to be true from Scripture. If you have further questions, feel free to fill out a contact form by going to the Contact Us tab and clicking on the link. You can even fill out a prayer request form too. It's so helpful for us to know where our listeners are at in their spiritual walk with God. Peter was a great example of someone who was devoted to following Jesus but he had his moments where his faith faltered like all of us. Peter's example should give you hope that there's redemption and restoration of relationship with Jesus, even if you mess up. You'll be looking forward to the next edition here in First and Second Peter. So join us again on Living Waters of Grace.